Dina Nayari is the library's current visiting fellow. As you can see from her background, she is not quite at the library, but this is, this is a photo of the library and the fellowship is generally supported by the DeGroote Foundation. And we actually have Claudette DeGroote in the audience with us this evening. Nayari is the author of The Ungrateful Refugee, which won and was shortlisted for a whole host of awards that you can look up online. The recipient of many fellowships, including most recently the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imaginations Fellowship in 2019, Nayari's stories and essays have been published by the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, The Los Angeles Times, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, and many others. Her debut novel, A Teaspoon of Earth and Sea, was translated into 14 languages. Her second novel, Refuge, was a New York Times editor's choice. Dina holds a BA from Princeton, an MBA, an MBA from Harvard, and an MFA from Iowa's Writers' Workshop. She was a Truman Capote Fellow and uh, teaching writing fellow at Iowa. Dina, thank you so much for being with us this evening. It's such a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you for having me, Alice. And thank you for that introduction. It's pleasure, so good pleasure. to be here. And you weren't supposed to tell people I'm not really in the library. I'm sorry. <laughs> As you can see, I am clearly in the library. <laughs> Dina is clearly in the library, even though the library is telling us that it's about 2 p.m. outside. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Dina, um, my first question to you is in a article that you wrote in 2017 uh, in Refinery29, the article was called Can an Author Write About Their Parents? You cited another writer, Elizabeth Stroud, who in her work, My Name is Lucy Barton, says that we all just have one story that we keep telling in different ways. How is and how does Who Gets Believed follow on from your previous work? such as The Ungrateful Refugee, and how is it different? Okay, well, thank you. Wow, what a big, exciting question just right off the bat. Um, I have to say, I was telling this before to Claudette about how um, you know good it is to be talking about a work that you're kind of doing right now instead of a published book, because you know probably this conversation will affect it. I hope it affects it. Um, but you know, this book actually does uh, so very naturally flow on from my previous work because um, I think all of my work examines this issue of credibility and voice, and you know, and and who at the end of the day gets to tell certain stories and whose point of view gets to be, you know, I guess spotlighted or you know kind of treasured, listened to, and whose point of view gets overlooked. And I think that that's kind of a question that's inherent in every story because in every story belongs to someone. Every story is somebody's point of view, right? Um, you know, that article that you mentioned, it was about my parents and it was about writing about my parents. And, and um, you know, from the very beginning of when I became a writer, I had this struggle um, with, I guess, not just my parents, many members of my family, even friends who, um, well, they, they didn't necessarily agree with the point of view that I had taken. Um, my mother, especially at the very beginning before she understood, you know, that my fiction was fiction. And luckily over time, she did understand that who would take, uh, you know, would object to every single mother in every single story because she thought that every single one of those mothers was a lie because it wasn't my experience with my mother. And she said, well, that's not me. And I had to then explain like, you are not my entire conception of motherhood. I can actually, you know, imagine and create other sorts of mothers. Um, and also, I, even if I'm writing nonfiction, I still get my own point of view. And that was a really sore point. So I think um, with this book, I'm kind of more explicit about that, you know, our individual stories, our points of view, and I take it toward kind of into the realm of the vulnerable people of the world, not just refugees and asylum seekers, but also people who've been wrongfully accused, people whose stories have famously not been believed for one reason or another, and I try to really understand why, you know, what is, what are the various codes that we have you know, kind of woven into society that we um, use to determine who is believable and who is not. Um, what was it? What language did they not have access to, I suppose? Yeah, um, let's, let's go straight there. Can you give us, just so, so this is tangible, because we're talking about very big concepts here. We're talking about truth, belief, yeah. disbelief, capital T, everything, capital, capital letters everywhere. <laughs> um, can you give us a kind of tangible example of a famous um, person or instance in the book of somebody who's believed and somebody who's not believed and maybe they were telling the truth or not yeah so um 
well, I don't want to give too much away, but I, you know, one of the stories that really uh, captured my attention was a story that, you know, you use the word famous, it's not famous because people haven't, like the media doesn't pay attention to this and it should have been, but it was a, a Supreme Court case from 2019 of a man called KV who came from Sri Lanka as a refugee. So he escaped, you know, detention camp and, um, you know, escaped the country and entered the UK uh, in 2011. Now he left at a time when, um, you know, the government were kind of famously um, imprisoning Tam Tamil tigers and torturing them all in exactly the same way um, on the back using, you know, with the exact same kind of, you know, mechanisms, etc. So they left very distinct, but very similar scars across the backs of many uh, Tamil tigers who escaped. So at the time when he came into the UK, um, the asylum officers were seeing the same scars, the same story over and over and over again. And, um, and they were starting to develop this very absurd theory, which they called, um, well, first of all, they, they asked the question, could these scars be self-inflicted? Um, self-inflicted because perhaps these people just wanted asylum. Perhaps they were willing to fake torture scars in order to get into the UK. So then they started to develop this very absurd theory called um, SIBP, self-infliction by proxy, which was the idea that if they couldn't reach their own back, that maybe they had a doctor do it. You know, like somebody actually put them under anesthesia, give them the scars that they needed, violating every Hippocratic oath and every other oath uh, for whatever little money a Tamil tiger could give in order to send these people off so that they could get asylum. It's an, it was an absurd notion. Um, but they said, look, we can't discount it. We can't say this didn't happen. So we're just gonna pretend that it did. And then we're going to reject the whole number of people based on this theory. So it was this kind of catch-all bucket. And if not this, then that bucket. There was no burden of proof attached to that bucket, right? There was a whole really high burden of proof attached to the other buckets of possibility, the more likely ones like the guy was tortured, right? But there was no burden of proof on this final bucket of possibility, which was that they did it themselves. Anyway, so this theory was kind of um, advancing in the home office and KV got rejected and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And um, of course, the fact that it went all the way to the Supreme Court shows how many lower courts actually believed the home office's version of things until the home office finally said, uh, this is an absurd theory. Like, why would you not believe this thing that obviously happened because it happens to so many other people because he has the proof on his back? So I, I got to interview KV and I got to spend some time with him and his lawyer. And, you know, his identity is still not you know disclosed. It wasn't disclosed by the court. I was very lucky to be able to talk to him. Um, and his story is kind of in the book and it's, I'm really proud of it. It's, I'm, I'm doing a lot of editing right now of the book and it's the one like the passages of KV I'm just not touching them. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think the home office was so scared to believe his story? Well I, I think that there's a lot of you know forces at play a home office uh, uh, you know officers we know are incentivized in particular ways they have quotas they say they don't they do they give incentives to the asylum officers to turn away people to find discrepancies to find any reason at all to turn someone away you know and um, they've kind of forgotten the mandates of the Geneva Convention, why it is that, you know, we have these gatekeepers. They're not to be gatekeepers, they're to allow in people who need refuge. Uh, they're to be rescuers, um, you know, to be humanitarian officers, not necessarily, you know, people who are there to slam shut the doors. Um, but I think that mandate has kind of changed in their minds what they believe their job is. I actually, for the book also, interviewed an, an home, a, a former, home office presenting officer who told me that her job very clearly said my job was to find discrepancies and I said well what about letting in people who the, the wretched of the world the outcasts the people who are hurting and she just chuckled she's like no it was to, my job was to find discrepancies you described your job as a writer mm -hmm. um, and as a refugee I mean so you yourself for anyone in the audience who doesn't know your story you yourself were a refugee from Iran you moved very early at a young age um, and found your way to America ultimately and, and became kind of the American success story, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you only have to look at your, your credentials um, that I wrote at the beginning to, 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 to say that and to know that. And, um, but you have described your, the kind of role of uh, refugee and as a writer looking past the discrepancies. 
can you can you speak more to this 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 parallelism between um I suppose your identity as a refugee and then your identity as a writer and how you you you're more believing and you're more credulous what do you mean exactly like say say a little more on this question okay well I'm going to read this quote yeah, yeah. from um page 13 in your yeah. book okay um so so let's take the example of the home office or really any asylum uh, officer and there as you mentioned looking looking for discrepancies and you write by contrast the truth of these stories struck me hard. I know that I, a writer, was peeking into corners that the authorities mm -hmm. wasn't. I wasn't looking for discrepancies. Uh, I abhor cyn cynical tracks that favor better translators and catch out trauma victims for their memory lapses. I don't have accent verifying software. I saw the truth of these stories in corroborating scars, so you mentioned the scars on his back, in distinct lenses on a single event, on seeing that the back as vividly as another sees the front. No flat cutouts. I saw truth in grieving, fearful eyes, in shaking hands, in the anxiety of children, and the sorrow for the elderly. And yet, to recreate these stories, I was forced to invent scenes and dialogue like retouching a fa faded photograph. Here's the point. Writers and refugees often find themselves imagining their way to truth. What choice is there? A reader like an interviewer wants special itches scratched. You will see. Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess what you're getting at maybe is the way I see the difference between facts and truth, you know, and um, I guess truth always includes a narrative, you know, there's no, and I, and I think that a lot of times people like that are very dogmatic who, or who are in dogmatic sort of jobs like asylum officers, or whatever, they tend to have such allegiance to facts, you know, that they don't realize that you can create lies out of a bunch of facts, you know, because if the narrative is wrong, you know, you can take, you know, kind of a scattershot of facts and kind of scatter them in a way that um, tells a story wrong. You know, you can put the focus on the, the facts that you shouldn't be putting the focus on. And, you know, you could distort numbers. Um, actually, as I was researching this book, I, I read the very interesting kind of campy book from the 40s or 50s about all the ways that st statisticians use correct statistics to lie, you know, and, and how they, you know, manipulate pictures and, and, and uh, use the wrong kind of graph or whatever. I mean, like facts alone are not enough. And, and that's really the point here, right? Like for me, I had a series of facts that were available to me because this was nonfiction. I had interviewed people. They gave me what they had, but um, you know there were holes in every story. You know, and, and I think even a journalist is allowed to to imagine. I'm not a journalist. I'm a storyteller. I write creative nonfiction, but um, you know you are allowed to imagine your way into the holes of a story um, if you do enough research. And that's what I had to do. So I had to go and like find um, the gaps. Uh, you know, where were the characters or the people that I was writing about? at that time, what can I find out about the politics uh, of that time, the dangers of that time in that place? What did the streets look like? What, you know, wh what were, who were they surrounded by? What might they have been, you know, kind of enduring or what kind of life might they have been living? And try to put those in scene because a good story is scenes. It's not just a bunch of, you know, rhetoric or a bunch of like telling. So um, for me, that story, the creating that you know, understanding of truth, a visceral understanding of truth that comes from having experienced a story was so much more important than just scattering this thing with facts, right? Um, you know, there's this book, I think in 2014 or 13 uh, uh, by John Degada um, called Lifespan of a Fact. Have you, have you heard of it? So it was really interesting. It was kind of a memoir of writing a book and arguing with his uh, copy editor, right? And he's a nonfiction writer, very famous nonfiction writer, who kept insisting on changing certain facts to fit a narrative because he wanted the narrative to be true. And sometimes he even changed facts just for aesthetic reasons. Like, I think I remember one interesting one was that he said, he just kept insisting on saying that there was like 13 or 14 bars in a particular town where there was like maybe 12. And his copy editor kept saying, no, 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 or his fact checker, I'm sorry, kept saying, that's not true, that's, there's 12. And he says, it doesn't matter to the story if there's 12 or 13, but 13 sounds better, don't you see? <laughs> you know, oh, don't you see how much more poetic it is? And don't you see how little it matters? And of course, the fact, or the fact checker had an equally valid argument that no, every, the integrity of this story depends on every fact being as correct as we can make it. And I agree with that too, but I think there's a tension between their, those two sort of arguments that's worth really looking at, right? Um, what, 
like how do we tell the truest story um you know sometimes it does mean looking away from certain facts although i would never i would never change one you know but um so I think that's the thing. I mean, as a writer, I think I was looking for truth in the stories that people were telling me, whereas, you know, maybe a fact checker or an asylum officer would be looking for facts. And in fact, asylum officers are just, they have a checklist. You know, they're looking for discrepancies. Anytime one fact doesn't match with another, they don't question it. They don't look for, you know, all the real world reasons that there could be that discrepancy, or they don't even look at anything like your memory, your traumas. They just say, well, there's a discrepancy. So you've been lying. We've mentioned uh, fiction, mentioned asylum seekers and the home office. Where are the other locuses, loci of truth that you investigate in this book? Where else do you go? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, well, it's hard to say that it's not finished, but I do uh, have one big story in there about a time when I was tragically the non-believer. I mean, there's a lot of examining of belief and faith in religion, you know, like um, my own background with Christianity. I mean, my mother, the reason we were, we were refugees is that my mother was a convert to Christianity from Islam. And my mother is extremely hardcore as a believer in Christ and, and you know, with her faith. And I have kind of lapsed in my belief. So I do a lot of examining of that. You know, what made me not believe this? What, what about this story um, makes it no longer compelling to me? And then also, if I am an unbeliever, to what extent am I an unbeliever? I mean, am I an unbeliever who will dismiss the vulnerable? You know, um, I really wanted to examine that about myself because, again, as I said, there's a tragic disbelief story um, of my own that I include in the book, and 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 so I kind of turn a little bit the the, the lens there on myself. Um, other look, I mean, there's there's. Um, Let's see. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I talk about uh, a lot about like belief and, and, and unbelief um, and uh, in, 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 I guess, philosophy and ethics and, of, and psychology, like what we believe just in the everyday, what makes us um, latch onto a story and remember it and, and make it a part of our own narrative and what makes us leave it, forget it. You know? Can you give us an example of a specific philosopher or theorist who, whose work really struck you, maybe you hadn't encountered before? Well, I mean, I, I, you, know, I, you know, my past is very much, uh, you know, I, I did economics and business before I became a writer. And at the time that I was at Princeton, there was a professor there who very shortly after I graduated won the Nobel Prize and his name was Daniel Kahneman. Do, do you know him? Yeah. And he, the interesting thing about him is that, you know, the entire time I was studying economics at Princeton, my entire area of study was focused on the rationality of, of you know, human decision making. We are rational as humans. And, and he was this kind of uh, economist slash he wasn't an economist, actually. He was a psychologist who, who was who was like basically poking a hole in the biggest assumption underlying all economic theory, which is that people act rationally. And and so him, he and some of his colleagues showed that, you know, actually people don't don't behave rationally um, in many situations uh, where they do have the, the information where they could. And um, and he del delves deeper into why and how we use certain parts of our brains. Um, I was really struck by the difference between our system one brains and our system two brains. You know, the very quick uh, instinctive responses and heuristics that we have versus, you know, the answers we come up with when we really think something through, when we put it through our system two, you know, our, our rational mind. Um, and so, I, and so I you, thought, you read this book for the first time for, for the research for, the, for who gets released? This, this was part of my research. Yeah, because Daniel Kahneman was not on my radar before he won the Nobel Prize. I was just an economics student, totally believing in rationality of, of people um, when they make decisions. Although I, actually, even as a young student, you would question that, you know, everything like that, any kind of thinking like that seems simplistic. I mean, we are made up of so many biases and we're made up of, you know, I guess so many, um, I guess, stories that that decide what we later believe or, or disbelieve. Um, so how, how does Kahneman's system wants, can you just briefly explain what that is to the audience and how does it relate to truth and belief? Sure. So I guess he, to put it very simply, um, he says that we have a system one part of our, I guess, way of thinking in system two. System one is those quick, you know, responses that are instinctive. So there's like a test um, that, that they have. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the questions on the test. Like one of them is, um, okay, if, 
if a baseball and a baseball bat cost a dollar ten, you know, together, and um, the baseball costs a dollar more than well, the baseball bat costs a dollar more than the baseball. How much does a ball cost? You, and your instinctive response might be to say 10 cents, but that's not the correct answer because that's what you did just by, you know, kind of very quickly hearing the dollar ten dollars. Well, the remaining must be one ten, right? So, but the answer is actually five cents if you do the math. So system one, two does the math. System one kind of blurts out a response. That's that's the gist of it. So in terms of belief or not belief, you're an asylum officer. You see the thousandth person with the exact same scars coming through. System one says. They faked it. This can't be real. System two says, wait a minute, though, there is a regime in that country who is giving everyone the exact same scars using the exact same methods, right? No, absolutely. I guess, okay. so who, who else, so talking about the loci of truth, who, who else are the arbiters of truth in your book? Where else are you going? Who, who's deciding what's true and what's not? And what do they have in common and how are they different? So, so the book is not, this book is not so much about kind of going through and, you know, pointing out all of the different places in society where, you know, kind of truth gets broken, although there's plenty of that. I think it's much, much more of a reflection about how and why we believe you know and so much of it like so much of my writing is focused on my own inner life and how I got to certain places and relating that to the stories of more vulnerable people so um you know yeah I mean, another big one I guess I've left out is I have a lot of stories from the innocence project the the wrongfully uh, the wrongfully convicted I mean that's a place our um our justice system in America at least I really all around the world that is completely flawed and, and we throw people in prison based on biases and based on stereotypes and based on you know uh, fear right and 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 um you can see in every single innocence project case just an entire you know just an entire little sub world of brokenness you know like somebody was failed by every system around them you know i have uh, stories from medical fields you know people who are not believed about their pain so uh yeah it, it, it's 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 a lot of kind of interlocking and overlapping systems that all rely on the same truth codes I don't want to say anything more because I feel like now I'm giving away the whole book. Does anybody else? I do we do we need to leave people wanting to read this thing? Perhaps yes, I yes, feel okay. like I'll step back. I'll step back. Yeah. I because I have a question really about this. So this struck me both times I read it. Um, you quote Edward Said in in the Ungrateful Refugee. There's a quote from Orientalism, yeah. um, and this is about how it it just strikes me that so much of your perspective on the world is one of looking in and making very acute judgments on the society in which you find yourself. And so this is to that point, Saeed writes, the more one is able to leave one's cultural home or else in your case, forced to leave one's cultural home, the more easily is one able to judge it and the whole world as well with the spiritual detachment and generosity necessary for true vision. The more easily too is one assess oneself and alien cultures with the same combination of intimacy and distance. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to this? I think this is such a beautiful quote. And I really like the part about the generosity necessary for true vision. Do you yeah. think there is such thing as true vision? And how does generosity play a role in that? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know about like, again, true vision sounds like one of those big capital letter things, um, you know, and, and I don't but I do love what you're saying there about uh, what you, I guess, honed in on in terms of generosity and, and just distance also, I mean, I think um, one struggle that I always have when people tell me, oh, I got something wrong about them or, or whatever, somebody who was inspired by them, I mean, this brings me just right back to like my, my parents, is just that I had always aspired to only write stories when I'm removed enough from them that I can see it with love, you know, that I can try to show it in all its beautiful flaws, that I can like, you know, show, show something for what it is, right? And then at the same time, get the audience to feel a warmth and an affinity toward it you know, not judgment, right? I mean, it's, it's different with systems. I'm happy to judge systems, <laughs> right? Like we can judge the American medical system or the American, you know, health system. We can judge, you know, the asylum system. But, but when you're writing about people, I think it's really important to um, even groups of people, you know, um, 
it's 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 really important to I think have that kind of um, remove so that you're able to see all of the cracks you've been there you've lived in that world but you're no longer like raging you're no longer you know burning with fury so you can you can have this affection and love and I feel like any character I've created based on my family members I've waited till I I feel that so I feel like I'm ready to show them in that way and so when they say that they feel like they were not shown in that way I feel like, like I failed you know what I mean um, so, so it's a question of time. I think. Well, it's a, no. Sometimes enough time, lots of time passes, and you never, you can never do that. You can never, you know, have that that kind of vision towards something. Sometimes you're tainted for something. Sometimes you're not meant to write about that thing ever again. If something has hurt you too much or traumatized you too much, I I can see why. I mean, certain refugees that I talk to who have who want to be writers, they want to write about nothing to do with their. Experience. They want to write about imagined worlds, something different. They say, I want to leave that story behind. And maybe in 10 years, they will want to write about it like I did, you know. Um, but some of them never will, you know. And why should they have to, right? I mean, if, if they, they know themselves better than anyone if they will do the story justice. So when you hear the story, so the kind of research you're doing for this new book is similar in the sense, in, in the research you've done for a previous book. So it's a mixture of historical research, philosophical, literary, and original reporting, which is what you definitely did for the Ungrateful Refugee. Mm -hmm. um, for the original reporting, does, do, these, do these stories still hurt you? And are they, are they, can they be hard to carry? Yeah, no. I mean, it, it, they are different in this book than in The Ungrateful Refugee, because in The Ungrateful Refugee, I was talking to refugees, most Persian speaking, um, you know, from Iran and Afghanistan, who were going through the same route that I had gone through, and many of them lived, you know, the the same story, you know, and so I was looking for, for overlaps for these, you know, kind of emotional and experiential overlaps that I was kind of mining um, in this way that was you know, by nature, just really triggering and, 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 and painful, but also really, you know, affirming. And um, it felt like vital to write this, to create this book. Um, but for this, you know, th when you look at things like, well, you know, the wrongfully convicted, or when you look at a story like Katie's, like these are things where nothing like this have, has ever happened to me. You know, I find myself having to um, really keep an open imagination and open mind. And it, it, it really uses my imagination in a way that maybe the others didn't because they were a story I had lived. The, the others relied so much more on memory and on association and all of these little like kind of, yeah, associative moments. And then with, um, with this, it's just like, I'm just, I feel like the only thing I have to offer is my narrative skills because there's nothing that I've lived can, that can, um, that can, you know, I, I suppose kind of connect to this in the same way. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. yeah. So your emotional reaction is different. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm much more intellectually engaged in this, you know, and there I was, you know, emotionally engaged in a different way because I had lived it. But the places where my emotions come into this with these kind of stories are, um, I, I guess I'm finding myself having to use the short story tools a lot more because when you get really intellectually engaged in something that you haven't lived, you're tempted to get rhetorical, you know? And so I'm looking and mining those moments of like human connection, of love, of like support, surprise like beautiful surprises um really injustice but this really felt and so I look to engage my emotions as any writer does but as far as it connecting with my own experience look I mean I have never been tortured I have never um been wrongfully convicted and imprisoned for 30 years I mean these stories are new to me and and I think that's what I find exciting and interesting does it make it easier to write since you have more of that intellectual remove easier to weave into a larger narrative no, I find it just about the same, just because at the point where I'm weaving it in, um, I'm just like, just engaged in this as a writer, you know, I'm thinking of the narrative, I think of it as a house I'm piecing together, it's like there's architecture here, you know, um, it's it, the emotions come in when you're gathering the stories, interviewing, you hear it for the first time, by the time you're shaping the book, you've, you know, that detail, like, you've read it over 110 times, it just, you just <laughs> kind of, it's a piece of the puzzle now. You talk about shaping the architecture of, of, of the book and it strikes me that you also are experimenting or certainly working on other forms 
of art such as plays and screenplays and so departing from one of the motivating questions of the book how does truth shift to accommodate insiders of class faith and culture i wonder how does truth shift to accommodate artistic form what do you mean wait how does truth shift to accommodate okay, maybe it's the inverse how does how does different how do different yeah. artistic forms shift to accommodate the truth, truth. Yeah. yeah yeah no i like the inverse better okay. <laughs> um, I let's think, stick with the inverse <laughs> yes exactly um you know i think e each of them shine a light on the truth in a different way and i think that's why i switch between forms so much it's so interesting you know to see how like for like drama for example i i'm i'm drawn toward theater and script writing and 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 you know screenplays and things just because i don't think there's any more visceral and truer way to really show something other than to bring it to life in front of them without any commentary you know with all that's unspoken about real life all that's unsaid all of the disconnects between human beings and how they crash into each other and how they wreck each other's lives without meaning to i mean these things are so fascinating and interesting and and that's why fiction is 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 so um so powerful and i think with that kind of fiction where you only have the visuals and the dialogue and not even ability to go into people's inner world um you kind of have a chance to really just show life as it's lived you know and make it you know present bring it into the present um I love short fiction because I get to, you know, kind of flit in and out of inner worlds and show the ways that people are lying to themselves, you know, play out a scene and then and then show how somebody is not being honest in how they narrate it to themselves. And I love that. I, I love lying characters. I love yeah, why? <laughs> well, exactly for this reason. It's because now you get a chance to show um, a little bit of motivation, but also just like how very different they experience something than the way the rest of the world saw it you know it's interesting it's much more interesting than when everything matches up perfectly and they really got the situation right <laughs> you know <laughs> like what it, what is what is the what is the interesting thing with that you know and that's why i really love the way people react to things like humiliation like in um in scene when you show someone being humiliated right okay like say on stage well, you can show then afterwards um, how things play out between the characters, right? But only say in prose and in short fiction or, or in long fiction novel, can you really show all of the work that goes into undoing that humiliation on the inside? There the drama is on the inside. Um, I think, have you ever read Gravity and Grace by Simone Weil? Like, yeah you know you know the part where she talks about how um the whatever it is weak in us secretes kind of an armor of lies so that it can be protected from the truth like the weakest parts of us like secretes an armor of lies i love it i love the idea of an armor being secreted it's so gross <laughs> um but anyway but the point <laughs> is that in order in order to protect us from the truth right okay so mm -hmm. the, uh, when we begin to build that armor against a humiliating moment that's drama and that's not a drama you can show in unless you're going to monologue. I mean, and I kind of think monologuing is cheating. Um, so that's why I like, you know, prose, because it allows us to go into that internal drama. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and then and then and then just to bring it to nonfiction, because I've been writing nonfiction lately. In nonfiction, I get to get rhetorical. I get to tell you, the audience, as me, Dina, what I think the world is doing wrong. And I can bring in other writers and quote them and get philosophical and talk the way we're talking now. And I think that's nice too. Mm -hmm. Writing is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so really, much. Hold on, hold on. Do you really think that all the time? Do you have writer's block? Uh, what's your process do you get frustrated i mean i'm just asking kind of yeah. like process here and then we have loads of really great questions so I'm okay gonna okay cool um yeah. writer's block and press well you know yeah i mean writing can be frustrating as a career i think in in many ways uh, you have to you have to produce all of this work and material you mind your own life you break people's hearts you have to deal with other writers i mean have you did you read bad art friend Okay, you have to. Okay, so I'm sure everyone here has read that New York Times article. Oh, the New York Times, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So I mean, there's there's all of the dramas about who owns a story. There's all of the dramas about you know, 
like the way you've told the story or what you've mined. So there's a lot of difficulties. Writer's block is not one of the big ones because if you have enough ideas going, you know, and, and you know how to, how to work after many, many years, you know that if one story isn't coming, you move to the next one or you read or you exercise, you do something to get the mechanism going, you know, and, and, and if you're completely blocked with all of your work, then you have to really examine what's going on with you. You know, um, maybe we need to... <laughs> if, if anyone on the call, and, and many of you haven't actually met Dina in person, but Dina almost vibrates with energy. I don't know, this is very clear from the conversation, but it's even more clear in person. Um, I'm not surprised that Weiss's block doesn't exist for you. I'm gonna go yeah, to... Oh, the... <laughs> yeah. I'm going to turn Emilio's question because it's great. He says, yeah. Dina, I can't wait to read this upcoming book. Congratulations on this residency. I have a question about location and writing. How is your writing affected by a given location, US, London, now Paris, and I'll add Emilio, soon to be Scotland. What has this residency offered you in terms of time and space for the book? How is Paris? How is Paris? Well, I'm now, I'm now back in the south of France, but no, I'm in the library. What am I saying? I forget what I just um, No, but I... I it is affected by location. And I, I think I, I've spoken about this before, I think specifically with Alice. I don't remember if this was on stage or in private. Alice and I have had so many conversations, but I think like the, the location matters because you do as a writer feel the need to reset and to see things anew and to really kind of get some distance from the last place that you were. I mean, I can't write about my life here until I've been there, you know? And so I think moving and creating a new space around you, talking to new people um, helps you. Um, not just to get perspective on other places, but also to like find the strangeness, you know, and I think the most, some of the best things in fiction and in nonfiction and any kind of prose is all of the strange details that are, um, you know, well chosen because they will surprise people and at the same time feel familiar. It's really easy to populate a story with a lot of detail, you know, um, the, the key is picking out the ones that are you know, singular and surprising and errant and maybe maybe a little out of place, but really completely in place or make the place. Um, and, and I think that it, it's really hard to know what those are until you've gone and tried to be you again in a different setting, right? So when I'm me in Paris, for example, I will find my Paris cafe, I will find my Paris writing friends, my Paris books, my place to write, place to find, uh, you know, research to talk to people. And then suddenly I realized, oh, there was something about this village I lived in, these are the things about it that were strange. These are the things about it that are not unrepeatable, right? And so I know what to bring out of that setting. And I think that's really valuable. Um, one other thing that this residency offered me, I think, is of course you need time away from your family. I'm a mom, I have a five-year-old. I'm sure you've heard her in the background, you know, um, during this talk. And, you know, it was really just nice to get a couple of weeks to be away and to be alone you know, to have solitude, to read, to putter around, to be bored, you know, and I think that my imagination came to life. I, I finished my very first play during this residency, um, and I'm really excited about it. I want to get to the next question, but I do want to briefly address uh, Elena, your daughter, because it strikes me at the end of the book you mentioned her, the book is dedicated to her and your partner, Sam, and I wonder how much of your invest, your fervent uh, investigation into truth and belief is is on behalf of her. I mean, you kind of explicitly yeah. say it. So you write, becoming a mother to a dark little girl with a mischievous smile, a mischievous smile in the age of Brexit and Trump terrifies me. Whatever her gifts, she's going to get herself into trouble in this hateful and slow, hateful world slowly coalescing around us. Yeah. Do you think Elena growing up will get believed? Well, you know, it's probably this very interesting dance and this constant struggle inside me because I know that the world is changing in a way that doesn't really appreciate, you know, people like her. But at the same time, I know that I'm capable of giving her all of these insider codes that I now have access to. And I feel like- Like she, what? Like what? Well, you know, like I'm I'm very educated. I've, I've gone to these schools. I know how she can get into these schools. I know what she needs to read. I know what she needs to not read. Well, well, probably nothing. Um, but but I, I think I, I, I feel like I can get her to a place where she can be, you know, someone who is generally believed. But is that what I should be doing? Shouldn't I? I mean, isn't it better to just tear down the system that completely victimizes the vulnerable who don't have access to all of this? I'd rather tear it down you know, rather than just to find a way to give it to my kid. It's like those people who, who argue against, you know, private schools coming in and taking all of these resources away from public schools, um, you know, who argue against that, but then 
send their own kids to private school, right? I kind of feel like that would be hypocritical. And so, um, but for me, I mean, I do worry about her and her generation because they're born in a world that's more and more cynical, um, you know, that in many ways is, is more dangerous, is more divisive, uh, divided. Um, and, um, but it's not that I want her to be on the right side of things or on the protected side of things, or on the safe side of things. It's that I want her to be part of, you know, kind of a bigger change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you, I, this is actually brings me to a question I had, and then I'm kind of going to get to your question. Do you know, you, we've talked a lot about unreliability and what makes someone an unreliable narrator. And it might seem obvious to the audience and even to you. You mentioned education, you mentioned books that one has read, should have read. What are some of the other characteristics of reliability in society today? And what was a surprising, some maybe surprising characteristics of reliability that you discovered? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it all comes down to, for me, to how you tell stories, you know, and I think that was the biggest thing I learned. And I wrote about it in, in the book that you read, um, you know, that the way people tell stories is kind of ingrained since childhood. It's it's a, a particular style, a particular code, and, and, and um, it's how we decide if something is true or not. So for example, you know, when Dutch asylum uh, officers listen to Iranians, I think uh, I, I've talked a lot about this Dutch lawyer that I talked to who said that he has to retrain Iranians and how to tell their stories. Because when Iranians tell a story, they don't start at the beginning of the story or at the beginning of their lives, they start at the beginning of the universe, you know, <laughs> like that's how Iranians tell a story starting with the beginning of the universe, because that's how we were trained to tell stories. We always started every story with a rhyme, which was the beginning of the universe rhyme. And it's about putting everything in context. You know, it's about like seeing your own life in context. It has nothing to do with the truth of your own story. It has to do with a, a style. It actually has a lot to do with humility, right? But when people come in and start telling an asylum officer about like the Iranian like history of, um, you know, the, the the history of the Islamic Republic and the regime before that and, and their grandfather and how he was oppressed, well, they think, well, you're lying about your own story because you have nothing to say, right? Um, you're hedging, you're starting too far back, you're not getting to the point, this must all be a sign of lying, because in the Western world, we tell stories a different way, we're told to cut to the chase, to start in the conflict, to start in the middle of things, and circle back around again, like that is American Western storytelling. Um, this is all unconscious, of course, like well, it's how, how, much of it, how much of it is, is uh, the narrative itself, and how much of it is the person who's telling it, just simply, no matter what they say, they're just not going to be believed based on their identity. Yeah, there's lots of that. I mean, I talk to asylum officers who say they have to dress their clients differently. Um, that they have, they keep, they you know, kind of um, try to signal things like how much wealth they had back home, um, you know, what kind of education they had access to. I mean, there's these markers of believability all have to do with class and money and um, privilege and you know proximity to westernness and proximity to whiteness. Um, these things are all signs of, you know, whether or not you, you know, are, are in a higher tier than other people across the world. I mean, in, and I remember, like, I, I, I don't know where I wrote about this, but in the, before the revolution, there was this kind of backlash against, in Iran, against um, what they called West toxification, which was this absolute obsession with the West, like everybody is so intoxicated with the West and with Western culture that they were pushing Iranian culture kind of into the shadows, they wanted to become Westernized. Well, you know, I think the world has generally been moving in that direction. The status markers are all Western, they're all white, um, elite, you know, eliteness, uh, rarity, you know, all of that stuff is about seeming like someone who has money and privilege and access to the West and access to whiteness. Can we talk about Elizabeth Holmes? I know it's probably in your book. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, you asked, actually, this was your first question. It was, you know, what was a story that was famously not believed and a story that was yeah. famously believed? Yeah. So um, Elizabeth Holmes, interestingly, I have been told to just cut her out of the book. Well, let's just, let's contextualize her because you write, okay. I got this from your application, by the way, so I hope it's but it was I, it was probably your your brief for the for the novel for the book. Are you like reading bits of my application now? <laughs> just, just a few. No, 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 no. Like this is turning into a full on grilling, Alex. A few demographics: um, America's top business schools, venture capitalists, and investors. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. What is your question? <laughs> my question is: um, 
Well, you, we're just talking about reliability and people who do get relieved. And, and she is the point in case of somebody who yeah. on paper and in person is totally credible, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It was a huge scam. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, for people who don't know who she is, I should give a little background, right? Um, because I'm sure everybody knows who she is. I mean, who doesn't really? Um, but she is this um, woman who at 19 years old, I think dropped out of Stanford and wanted to make a um, pharmaceutical company or, uh, wherein she could test uh, for many, many diseases with one drop of blood. She said she had the technology and um, she got all of this funding from some very famous venture capitalists and some, you know, kind of... Um, Silicon Valley, you know, deal makers and tastemakers and people who were generally believed to be, you know, kind of buttoned up in who they invest their money with. And um, that they, I mean, they generally are good at spotting talent. Um, she got all of this backing and um, she built a company at some, at one point she was like the, the like richest or the youngest self-made billionaire in the world or something along those lines and then she like something um horrific like that. Huh? what <laughs> something horrific like yeah that. exactly exactly she was on the cover of forbes and fortune and all of those magazines and she and there was always something off about the way she spoke about her technology i mean it was always really really vague i think the new yorker called it comically vague the way she described the technology and she always said because it was proprietary but she at one point actually said like some a science happens or something like that you know a, a process is is done so some silly you know cartoonish thing like that and anyway but people continue to believe her that she had this technology as the years passed there was little less and less proof of it um and um in the end to kind of make a long story short she it was all hoax i mean she had lied and she had hid the state of the technology which was in absolute shambles kind of behind closed doors and hired all of these scientists and mistreated them and tried to force them to kind of push through a technology that was essentially science fiction right um and then when this was discovered uh, there was this wonderful investigative journalist who you know discovered all this and wrote this big book about it and um yeah and now she's being she's on trial for fraud right so the thing that was interesting to me about her story was that it was so obvious from the beginning that she couldn't possibly have this technology. She was 19, you know, she wasn't using the right language. She wasn't a scientist. She didn't show anyone any proof that she did this. It was all based on vision, you know, and this idea and the fact that she was this great, you know, revolutionary or visionary thinker. It was all according to this kind of language and standards of Silicon Valley and um, the, you know, the business world about who has great ideas, who are the great, you know, change makers of the world. And these people don't necessarily have to have any talent, just the ability to wield the masses or the talents of other people. And maybe she had that. And so they believed her. But the point is that she was of a particular set, right? She was this Stanford woman and she dressed a certain way and spoke a certain way. And she was, you know, kind of fit the bill for who could be a visionary and who could be a leader of, you know, of, of, of you know, great thinkers and, and she just wasn't and, and nobody else would have been given that kind of leeway for so long and all of that money um I'm not writing about her in my book just simply because enough okay so we're no, so no spoilers there <laughs> yeah no spoilers. I'm, I'm happy I'm happy to rail against uh, ah! <laughs> well you know the, it seems like the point the one point of departure is how come she gets believed over and over and over again when this is so clearly fake and so outrageous and then somebody who uh doesn't look like her at all and yeah. has real truth in what they're saying doesn't get believed I mean that, that yeah. yeah I mean she's just it fit comfortably in what people's yeah. vision of, of what yeah. someone who would come up with that technology yeah looks like and talks like and comes from what kind of family she comes from etc you know I mean if 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 you know a, a 19 year old like or I don't know, even a 30 year old like tech geek, you know, who was, you know, black and somewhere in Europe or in Africa or whatever came up with this, um, they would be put through yeah. you know, the ringer to make sure that this technology was real, mm -hmm. right? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, this is, this is totally unrelated, but it's a great question from Claudette, who mm -hmm. writes, as I speak, as I, as I listen to you speak, I keep thinking that who gets believed is also influenced by where and how we show empathy. Could you speak about the role of empathy versus the rational mind and how we choose to believe. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things that I found was that we tend to believe people who are like us, whose stories are like us. Um, I talked to a doctor who I quote in the book, and I asked him, you know, after he told me all of these stories of pain not being believed, um, he said, I said, how, how then do we kind of like perform for doctors correctly so that we, you know, get our pain believed? And he said, you know, all I can tell you is try to imagine uh, uh, you know, the most important woman in that doctor's life and try to be like them, you know, try to imagine that doctor's mother or their wife, what kind of background would they have, you know, what kind of, uh, like, is this, is this doctor, whether man or a woman, the, come from a family in which the women are, you know, what, how do they talk? What are their rules? Uh, how do they joke? Do they joke? Do they not joke? And just be as much like that person as you can possibly be. And, and, and you'll trigger some empathy, you know? Um, the thing is that we feel for those who are close to us and we feel for the people who act like the people who are close to us, right? But that seems to me that that's, that's kind of a, a dark way of interpreting the question because it, it's unconscious empathy. What about the radical act of empathy where I, I meet someone and I say, okay, yeah. there's no observable difference the unconscious empathy isn't bubbling up from me naturally but I still am going to make a big effort and show empathy yeah and maybe you know maybe you're right in that because I guess Claudette's language was also versus in how we who we choose to believe or how we choose to believe and I think when you're asked invoking it, invoking empathy yeah. Yeah. And I think when you are choosing to believe someone, then you are doing that. You're more active. You're in the system too, I suppose, of your mind. And you're saying, you know what? This story makes sense to me. And I, I, I believe it. I choose to believe it, even though, um, even though uh, you know, this, this story is maybe not familiar to me or is not part of my world. But I have to say that like choosing is an intellectual thing to do, right? And invoking system, or system two is an intellectual thing to do. You do it with your mind. And empathy tends to be kind of like triggered with similarity. I mean, it's, it's an emotion, right? I mean, of course it's tied to, the, to your intellectual practices in the long run, but in each instance, it happens in the moment, right? So I tend to think actually we do empathize in general with people we find some similarity with, and we just don't see the other stories. I mean, there's think of all the many times around you that some heartbreaking story is happening, and when do you see it and when do you not see it, right? Okay. I'm sure there's much that we're, we're blind to, and that depends on who we are, right? So, so I think there is an argument here to try to override your natural empathies with the system too, with your intellect, right? In order to, uh, to really understand and believe someone like say KV, or, I mean, we, we do have to use our minds. We can't just be like, well, I don't empathize with him. And I think that's because our, you know, triggers for empathy are, you know, they're biased. Um, but I think over the long term, you can build, you, like you said, you said radical empathy. I think radical empathy is a practice and it's long term and you build it in yourself. Like you can't go home tomorrow and say, OK, I'm now going to be empathetic, right? <laughs> because then you'll just be more empathetic to the people who are like you again, you know? Like radical empathy is a practice it, and it uses your intellect. You say, I'm going to believe this person because their story is rational, right? Or because this story happens, because I know that, um, you know, the alternative in my head is paranoia or it's fear or whatever. You do that enough. And the next time you see a story like that, then your system one is different. You're, you, you feel empathy, you know? You know, what's been the biggest challenge for you writing this book? the pandemic <laughs> no it's hard i i like to go into no, I, mean, I mean intern internally it, the the piece that you no, want no, to it's the, the, listen, the pandemic is has affected the way i work on this because i i like to go into people's spaces i like to go into people's home i like to have um you know a cup of tea with them and see what they surround themselves with what is their context i mean um luckily i mean i met with kv and, and a lot of the people in this book before i um before the pandemic happened, but during the lockdown, I've been doing so much editing, so much reimagining, so many Zoom calls. Um, but I would have liked to sit down with some of the people that I interviewed since then. And I think that that has been a challenge. This is, it's immersive for me, the writing process, because I do connect it so much to my own, you know, story and my own world. And, you know, I told you before that these stories have been intellectual, whereas, whereas remember before when we talked about the stories for the ungrateful refugee and those were so viscerally connected with my own experience. Maybe part of it is the fact that I sat down in those 
in those spaces in the ISO boxes with the refugees. And here it's been over Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so your 70%, 85%, uh, where are you in the in stage of writing it? Maybe you don't have to put a numerical value, but. Oh, it's, it's almost done. I, I have to okay. turn it in. Yeah, I have to turn it in next month. I have to turn in a second draft next month. I've already turned it in a first draft. Yeah. What's your favorite, and we've definitely spoken about this, just you and I, but for the audience, what's your favorite part of the writing process? I like editing. I like the part where you get brutal with your own sentences and you just cut and cut and cut and cut. Are you good at, are you good at sometimes called killing your darlings? Can you, yeah. are you good at killing your darlings? Oh God, I am murderous with my darlings. Are you? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I love, I, what, I want, what I love best is reading a piece, like a series of pages that I have um, where I thought the most beautiful poignant thing was like at the end, that's where you kind of put the most beautiful poignant thing. And I rework it, rework it, rework it until I find something I completely overlooked. I, I, I wrote it quickly, you know, it, I didn't even think about it at the time. And that becomes the real heart of those pages and, you know, the, the real end of the section. And I find something that came out of my subconscious. And, and the only way I can find that is by editing around it. Actually, that's a, that's a great point because I wanted to ask you what has, um, what's been the consequence of your own belief systems on writing the book? Has it shifted? Well, I mean, so much of the book is about my belief systems, right? And it's about how... And which one has been the most difficult to interrogate or most revelatory? Well, because I, I thought of myself as someone who believes the vulnerable, right? And there's a story in here about a time that I didn't. So I think, I, I mean, I, I am, I, gosh, I've dedicated most of my career to writing stories, of people whose stories don't usually um, get believed, right? And so... I think that was the hardest thing. I'm not going to say more because- <laughs> No, I know you're going to absolutely murder me. I'm stopping right there. Um, just Connie points out that the book we were talking about, um, about Elizabeth Holmes is called Blood Money by yeah. John Carrier. And she yes. says it's spine tingling. And it's also- Connie, I agree. I, I read it in two sittings. Also, there's a really great documentary that was made um, that departed from the book, which is also spine tingling because I'm sure I haven't actually read the book, so I can't say, but she as a person just to watch on screen, she's so robotic and clinical and, and cold that you do actually have to see her as well as read about her, I think, at the same time. You do. You yeah. do. Yes. And also, I, I encourage you to read, to go looking on YouTube for some of the early videos when she is like. 20 or 22 I mean when she's really very young and um just see how little substance there is in what she says about her discovery like it's you'll, funny you'll that you keep fun. coming back to youth you think youth plays a factor in this well I just don't think 19 year olds typically discover these like world-changing technology I mean but in, terms, no, but in terms of belief no 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 but what I mean I I mean because the youth is just a point on which like that she has going against her and it got overlooked mm -hmm. right because this was science it was about deep deep like medical yeah. technological science so um you if you have someone coming in with some unexpected aspect to their to their narrative or to their you know like cv mm -hmm. like that they're only 19 and they haven't finished college yet you question right you say well did you like do you really have this because here's a big red flag right and the fact that that big red flag was overlooked and she sounds like a 19 year old who hasn't discovered anything and all of that is still still overlooked is really really damning it's it's incredibly damning for our society and for the people who decide you know who deserves opportunity and funding and a voice and all of that